Uh, thanks, Redbeard, for the introduction. Thanks, Matthew, for, uh, for joining us, uh, for joining me. We did a, a panel at Tectonic Summit. I don't know if, how many of you were at Tectonic Summit in New York uh, last year, but we did a similar kind of uh, panel event. Um, and thank you very much to the CoreOS uh, team and the developers for having uh, such a wonderful set of security tracks. I can't tell you how many uh, conferences I go to where security is an afterthought, where there's a single talk, <laughs> and people think that's good enough. Uh, I know that for CoreOS, the mission is to secure the internet, which makes a whole lot of sense. Um, as a person that writes security, uh, I can tell you that security is always an excuse for any company not to do something. Uh, because in my line of work, I thrive on the drama and fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So anytime something breaks, uh, that's good for me, not good for you. If it, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, so, uh, first question I've got for you, uh, Matthew, is I know we're talking here at CoreOS Fest about 40 minutes ago, according to my watch. Uh, <laughs> Docker introduced something called Docker Security Scanning, which is an evolution of something called Project Nautilus. Uh, CoreOS has Claire. These are kind of similar sort of ideas. What's your general thoughts on uh, security scanning uh, of the Claire Docker security scanning nature? Sure. Well. I think this seeing so many companies independently developing this kind of technology does speak to the fact that it was a common fear that containerization would result in us having a large number of containers which would not get updated, where we would be deploying apps or containers that contained uh, very old versions of security critical libraries. And these are the solutions to this problem. Well-built, well-maintained containers will have appropriate metadata that allows us to identify security vulnerabilities, will allow us to automatically inform admins of which components suffer from which vulnerabilities, where they're being run, and allow them to make an informed decision about how to rectify this. So from our side of things, Claire, we've developed this in the open because, honestly, security is as you know, I've spent some time playing with Internet of Things kind of devices, and many of these have turned out to be, shall we say, not particularly secure. But identifying their insecurities has been more difficult because I'm dealing with binary code. I don't have any of the source to be available to analyze this. Cases where I have found vulnerabilities which have then been apparently fixed, I, it's much harder to verify that it's a real fix because the source wasn't available. So. My feelings in general are if you can't look at the source code of a piece of security technology, why do you trust it? And security is not something that should be implemented in closed source software. Security is not something that you should have to pay additional money for either. Secur when we developed these features in Claire, uh, sorry, Claire in Quay, the idea there was to, as you said, our aim is to secure the internet. And we don't secure the internet by giving people a financial incentive to ignore security. Makes sense. Um, and then the way I understand Claire and Docker Security Scanning, formerly Project Nautilus, is they both look for uh, known CVEs. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Verizon, uh, with their data breach investigations report, they look at 80,000 breaches in a year, et cetera. They'll tell me and anyone in my line of work that eight of the top 10 uh, exploits, breaches in any year, are from known vulnerabilities. So, that makes a lot of sense. But then there's all the um, unknown things, mm -hmm. those that are not known CVEs. Uh, and as I mentioned to you just before we got up on stage, maybe five minutes, maybe, uh, after the Docker security scanning uh, release crossed the wire, I had my inbox full of people saying, oh, known CVEs, we know better. There are companies, not to name names, because this isn't being recorded, uh, but uh, companies Twistlock, et cetera, et cetera, on and on down the list that will tell me dynamic scanning, static analysis, these sorts of things are needed because CVEs are not enough. What's your general feeling on that? My biggest concern with static analysis is that while, yeah, it will probably find some additional vulnerabilities, the absence of a hit does not guarantee or give you any real expectation that there are no known vulnerabilities. You will find a subset of vulnerabilities that have not previously been identified, but it's also very difficult to tell the difference with purely static analysis between vulnerabilities that are meaningful and vulnerabilities that are based on your use case, based on the way this code has actually been incorporated into the project in question, are impossible to trigger. And increasing admin lows to deal with potential vulnerabilities that are not 
real is unhelpful when that time could instead be used to engage in additional efforts to improve security within your infrastructure, for instance. So I think there is a... My personal feeling is that security that is designed in such a way to give people certainty within a particular constrained problem space is frequently more meaningfully useful than security functionality that gives you a slightly wider set of expectations, but in a poorly bounded problem space. Uh, you don't know necessarily what to do when this gives you a little green tick box. Uh, if your aim there was to say, well, I built this container without using any package metadata, I pulled various binaries from various places, and then the static analysis scanner will save me, I, you're going to have a bad time. That's, that's going to result in security disaster later down the road. And I think adopting solutions that encourage people to adopt best practices, uh, to have meaningful metadata around their binaries uh, and within their containers is a much more responsible way of handling this. Fair enough. And then to go half a step beyond, in the uh, cloud world, people will tell me you need to do a service chaining injection for firewall, load balancer, uh, antivirus, all these sorts of things to inspect traffic, so, sort of similar how Twistock does it, that kind of thing. When we're talking about a larger uh, container deployment, is there a need for that type of uh, third-party inspection, as it were, or not necessarily if we've done everything correctly at the configuration layer? <laughs> if we've done everything correctly, then, well, we don't need any security functionality at all because we've written secure software in the first place, we've put appropriate mitigations for the cases where we have made mistakes. Realistically, adding additional layers of security is probably never a particularly bad thing. Ideally, we want to design technology in such a way that those things aren't needed. Realistically, we're humans, and no matter how good any of us are at developing software, we're going to make mistakes. And if there is additional code that can catch that, that's fine. As long as, like I said, this does not result in people feeling that they can be sloppy because there's an additional layer of safety to save them. Fair enough. Uh, and then aside from uh, known exploits, which is what exploit kits uh, love to do, uh, the other uh, primary trigger for the vast majority of, of breaches that I write about or anybody writes about are generally driven by some kind of privilege escalation where uh, an attacker breached a, a privileged mm -hmm. user and then escalated from there. So if I attacked somebody in CoreOS or I attacked you, which I wouldn't do because you would come after me and that would end badly, um, and then maneuver around inside. So. Given that we've got a secure infrastructure, we'll call it trusted computing, we trust the infrastructure, mm -hmm. can we trust the users? And assuming that we can't, then how do we configure a container environment properly where we have a trusted environment but not trusted users? <laughs> uh, so I, I, as far as I'm aware, do not actually hold any privileged position within the core OS infrastructure. Uh, you would not be able to do anything particularly interesting merely by gaining access to my credentials. And I told this in most cases, the same is true for any of us, uh, where we do have additional privileges. Ideally, those will be linked to role accounts rather than individual accounts. And well-designed infrastructure around this is going to be, in many cases, much safer than any kind of mitigation we can apply at a later point in time. But in the container space, I. Ideally, things like trusted computing mean that even if someone does gain the authorization to be able to launch additional things with almost legitimate access to the control plane or legitimate seeming access to the control plane, we then have the technology to at least audit that this has happened. If an intrusion is discovered later, we can go back and we can figure out exactly what's happened. And while that doesn't protect you at the time, that does mean that you have a much stronger idea of what kind of damage has been done. I think that's a really important thing. We have seen that's one of the, uh, we've seen cases where companies have been compromised, thought that they had some idea of what the attacker did, and then put their service back up again, and then immediately been taken down by another attacker. And there's certainly been several Bitcoin companies that have had unfortunate experiences this way. Having meaningful understanding of what's happened on your system is vital to being able to handle security issues. And as you said, it's probably unrealistic to believe that we will always 
only have users who employ uh, appropriate levels of paranoia around their credentials. And if someone is going to be able to get access, that will probably happen eventually, and you need to be able to determine what's happened and what kind of cleanup to do afterwards. Good, because uh, being a, uh, a stupid user myself uh, that has no patience, typically when I'll deploy uh, in my own test dev, I'll chmod triple seven to get stuff to work. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I may have forgotten once or twice. Uh, but then there's a few examples of breaches I've seen in the last uh, year where people left chmod triple seven. Standard saying in security, you can't patch stupid. But from a container platform perspective, can you insulate against stupid, as it were? One of the benefits of container-based deployment is that if you make a mistake within your container, that should be as far as it goes. And adopting this kind of modularity, being able to have much stronger trust boundaries within the system is immensely helpful here. Uh, if I'm in a system where we have somebody who is configuring the web server and we have some, someone else configuring the database and they're both running in the root namespace, and if the web admin is perhaps uh, lazy or makes a mistake or you know, any of the number of factors, which are not necessarily stupidity that can result in security breaches, maybe a piece of documentation is incorrect, maybe there was a bug in a script that resulted in an uninitialized variable being used and Chmod being applied to slash rather than a subdirectory. Containerization restricts the damage that that is likely to do. Uh, we need to do more in terms of ensuring that the kernel is strong enough, containers are strong enough, that there's absolutely no real way anybody's going to escape from a container. But even now, you're still going to have a restricted amount of damage that can be done by that kind of mistake exist, uh, escaping into a production environment. Good. Uh, another piece of, uh, of news that the Docker people uh, announced, which uh, you may or may not be familiar with, is uh, an advancement of this um, institute uh, study, benchmark study for uh, benchmarking best practices for container deployment, that's specifically mm -hmm. for Docker 111, I think, etc. Because uh, the basic idea is that the default installation of Docker engine is not secure by default. Uh, when we're talking about containers, whether it's uh, Docker as the engine or Rocket as the engine, um, is there a way that we can be secure by default out of the box, or is it always going to be a question of configuration? I think the aim should always be to fail safe, and that means that default configuration has to be as safe as possible. Um, where we're failing at that, we're going to need to continue working on improving it. Uh, I, think, I think any argument that defaults being insecure by default is acceptable is a failure by us as an industry rather than um, an acceptable outcome. Fair enough. Um, and then I know that uh, CoreOS itself, uh, on, on managed Linux at least, still supports uh, Docker, I know, because that's how I run mm -hmm. it. Uh, I know in Tectonic it's just Rocket. Uh, certainly when I get um, various things from analysts, uh, they'll compare uh, rocket to, to Docker. When you're looking at it from a security person's perspective, are you doing the same kind of checkbox item lists saying, okay, well, we've got set comp profiles, they've got set comp profiles, we do user namespaces, they do, and trying to make sure there's parity, or does that not necessarily matter given that we have to support both? The aim within CoreOS is to ensure that everything within this is run in as secure a manner as possible. So when we introduced SE Linux support into CoreOS and then tied that into Rocket, we have since then ensured that Docker's SE Linux support works equally well in CoreOS. Uh, we don't want users to have to make strong security decisions based on which container engine they prefer to use. And what we have definitely seen over the past year is that Docker have been doing excellent work in security. And we want that level of security to be possible on CoreOS, even if you choose to use Docker. We obviously want Rocket to have the same level of security. And we are very focused on ensuring that we have, at the very least, feature parity between the two of them. And we also want there to be feature parity between running Docker on CoreOS and running Docker on Ubuntu or Fedora. But long term, we definitely hope that our focus on overall system security, and especially the fact that we are free to make decisions that are optimized for container deployments rather than having to support every other operating system use case, means that Rockets on CoreOS is going to be a much more secure solution.
And then as a security person, uh, standard best practices always tell us that we should be doing, we talked a little bit about static analysis, uh, there's dynamic analysis, penetration testing, uh, bug bounty programs, which I know you have uh, your fair share of familiarity <laughs> with. Uh, when we talk about the container ecosystem, I don't necessarily see that quite as much. Uh, where do you see the role of those standard tools of the security trade fitting in? I think there's, well, in some ways, container deployments have been less interesting because there is this uh, compromising a single container means that you only have access to that container unless you're then going to come up with a kernel vulnerability or something that allows you to escape from that container and go further. And I think that's meant that many security people have not spent as much time looking at this because it's a kind of less exciting thing to achieve is, wow, I broke into a container and then I didn't get any further. And the people who are going further than that are the ones who are sufficiently skilled that uh, they are not necessarily, their skills are not necessarily at their most profitable when engaging in responsible disclosure. So I think there is definitely more work to be done there engaging the security community and encouraging them to start paying attention to how people are changing the way they develop and deploy applications because um, the worst case scenario is that security people end up with a set of skills that's just not particularly relevant to the way that security in the real world is, sorry, this applications in the real world are being deployed. And they then suffer from uh, having to spend a bunch of time relearning things without being able to do anything interesting in the meantime. And we suffer because when people are doing this kind of research, we are learning where we're failing. Uh, it's every time someone compromises a system and describes how that happens, we learn how to help make that less likely in the future. Good. Uh, in Greg's uh, keynote yesterday, he talked a little bit about uh, how every bug could potentially be a security vulnerability. Never ceases to amaze me how uh, the uh, most advanced hackers in the world will pair and chain use after free memory vulnerabilities to somehow do something. Um, does that concern you? Well, I would assume it concerns you, but mm. when, you, when you look at bugs, when do you determine or when do you have to make that assessment as a security professional? this is exploitable or do I need a chain for this to be exploitable and I need to be worried? I mean, realistically, uh, there's a lot of bugs. <laughs> we, as a society, we're terrible at writing software, which is unfortunate since you know, we rely on it for everything. Uh, so there's, I am not, skilled enough and I do not have enough time to be able to look at every bug and determine whether this could be meaningfully exploited. And the, many of the people who do this are both uh, better than me and also much more willing to spend the amount of time it takes to do something with this. Unfortunately, my job does require me to do actual work some of the time. Uh, I should probably say this since my employers are watching me. And there is an element of truth in what Greg says when potentially every bug could be a security bug. And I, I don't agree with him on every aspect of this, but pretty much every bug should be considered high priority. And we're not going to fix all of them. The kinds of mitigation technologies that GRSEC has pioneered and that are, with luck, gradually being brought into the mainstream kernel by people like Case Cook are vital for this because uh, while we cannot and probably will never track down every single bug, there are many things that we can do that make it much less likely that those bugs are exploitable, even by people who are willing to spend six months trying to chain things together. That's the real risk, especially with nation state types who won't talk to us afterwards. Uh, but we won't talk about them, even though they might be mm -hmm. listening. Uh, last question, uh, because this is a, a quick chat. Uh, given all the things we've talked about so far, given all the wonderful things talked about at this conference, I, before this I was in a session about uh, DEX getting, uh, or rather Kubernetes 1.3 getting role-based access control, which is kind of interesting. Uh, lots of things, uh, you're, you're doing the trusted computing, uh, distributed trusted computing from end to end. We talked a little bit about uh, standard penetration testing, bug bounties, uh, how that may fit in, etc. What's next? What's the big item in security for you in containers that's on the to-do list, or is it just continued execution and vigilance, as it were? 
Well, let's certainly keep on doing what we're doing and just do a better job of it. And I think that's going to be a large part of it. But there are definitely additional technologies that we can move on to. Uh, James Bottomley recently wrote about introspection of containers from the host kernel in order to obtain more insight into what's happening inside containers and perhaps identify compromised containers more rapidly. But we can go further than that. It's, uh, I think that's going to be an interesting field of research, but I think what's going to be an even more interesting field of research is the use of, uh, as Microsoft are already beginning to do in Windows 10, the use of hypervisor-based security to monitor the running operating system and look at the kernel itself and gain insights into whether the kernel has been compromised in any way. That's a field where there's a lot of wonderful research that's already been done in academia and very little that's made it to the real world. Uh, I think the first people that start pushing that into production are going to be able to do a lot of amazingly cool work and give much stronger security expectations. Well, thank you.